Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, and you know that I love uh, hearing about and meeting and bringing to you scholars that are just doing really interesting things. Uh, scholars should be our new superheroes. They should be our new celebrities, and we should be getting our celebrities from love and hip-hop. Uh, and the person that I, I, I brought today is Dr. Kyla McMullen. Uh, Dr. McMullen, currently she's at Clemson University. She's on her way to University of Florida. She also has a Ph.D. Now, check this out. Pay attention. PhD in computer science from the University of Michigan, uh, which means that it's a it's a real PhD in a really tough field from a really tough school, which means that she is bad. So do not try to mess with her. And so first, I want to I want to ask Dr. McMullen, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I'm doing well. I'm a. Uh... Here in New York at a conference, but I'm glad I had a few minutes to talk to you. Yeah, well, I'm glad you did too, and I appreciate you taking this time. Um, you know, you uh, you got my attention because you actually created this this really amazing list of the sexiest black female scientists. Uh, it, it, so, it, I it, did. It, it, and the list <laughs> caught on fire. I mean, you know, it it, it, it did it did almost as well as that mugshot. <laughs> got, right, you know, it's, a mugshot on my page too, man. Right, right. I would have uh, had double. Right, a sister, a sister can be a scientist and be sexy. Brothers got to put up mugshots, right? So, <laughs> so, but you know, but I, I love it. I loved. I, I personally, I thought it was, um, it was creative. Um, it was bold. Um, it, it was the kind of thing that I think um, a, a true scholar does. You know, you you use your intellectual freedom to do things that you think will make the world a better place or make your life more meaningful, stuff like that. Um, first, I want to ask you, what inspired you to create this list? Man, what inspired me to create this? So a number of things inspired me. So the first one was, number one, I've always thought that black women weren't represented well in computer science and in science in general. Like, for example, when I go out in the community and I meet people and I tell them what I do, they treat me like what I call a black unicorn. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you exist. I didn't know people like you do things like that. And I'm like, well, I'm just me. You should see my friends. I have friends that do this too. <laughs> so they're like, wait, all of you? Like, you know, I've been out with my friends numerous times and people are like, wait, all of you are getting PhDs? All of y'all are engineers? All of y'all are not like, people are just amazed. So it never really occurred to me that the world was not always exposed to black women who were doing these kinds of things. And, you know, being in grad school, Michigan had a very large population compared to most schools, I'll say, of, you know, black people who were doing, um, you know, science and engineering and just really tough majors. So I was kind of in a bubble. I was used to it. I'm like, of course, you know, why, why else wouldn't we? So mm. that was one thing. The second was the article that Business Insider put out where it said, you know, the 50 sexiest scientists, just period. So I was like, oh, let me look on the list and see if I see anybody I know. And I actually did know one person on the list, the black guy that I went to college with. But then I looked and I was like, wait, there, there's no black women on here. What, what's, what's going on? So then I thought to myself, you know what? I could think of 50 black women to put on here because they had, you know, 50 sexiest. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to make my own list. Show them I can give you 50. I could fill this whole list, even though you couldn't find <laughs> one. I could fill this whole list with 50 so you know just to be a resource so people can know that we exist and uh, the third reason is because like I don't think that little black girls know that this is an option like that science is an option for them I have two um, my cousin has two daughters I call them my nieces sometimes but they um, one of them is really into computer science and when she found out you know that I graduated from Michigan and did computer science she was like you do that really like she like she really likes computing she had no idea that I did that so I wanted to bring more visibility to just science in general for all the kids out there for all the people who don't know we exist mm. well, you know I, I, I love that I lo you know I think, I think the easiest way to get on a list is to create your own list yeah right and and that's I, I think what we need to do um, and <laughs> and I, I just applaud it so much because as you know I mean in mainstream media uh, the beauty of black women is not recognized nor appreciated. That's and true. It's, 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 and it's almost like sometimes you, you see these lists of the 50 most beautiful people or whatever, and, and yeah. you almost feel that sometimes the only way a black woman can be considered beautiful is if she looks like a white woman, right? Yeah. Or, or engages, you know, embraces these European standards of beauty. Yeah, and her blackness is drowned out. <laughs> right. And, and I yeah. so, so a long time ago, I just concluded as a black man that there just are no 
a tr- you know that the that the black women in Hollywood are usually going to be uh, I'd say mediocre relative to the black women you see on the street, right? There's just nothing like what you see with black women. Yeah. I think it's great, and and I, I like the fact that you were bringing this intelligence to the to the forefront as well. Uh, Definitely, you know, just it, it, and because I got some pushback on this, and I'm going to ask you about this as well. You know, there were some people who said, "Oh, well, this objectifies women." Um, you know, you're you're somehow making it appear that a black woman can only be attractive if she looks a certain way or or that the only way we can present black women to the world is um, by sort of you know highlighting their physical attributes over the intellectual um, I assume you got that same criticism oh how, yeah how have you responded to that well I responded in a number of ways so the first thing is that you know we're really funny to say oh this objectifies women objectifies people but we didn't say that when the first article came out we never said scientists were being objectified you know in the first article so that's mm. number one Number two is that I feel like in this article, I really wanted to put pictures of women who looked like people you see every day. Because for this generation, I feel like um, this is going to be the new generation of um, people who are going to be scientists and engineers. They're very visually oriented. They're very, you know, selfie, 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 Instagram, Facebook, new profile picture every day. They're very visually oriented. So if we show people in these not so glamorous careers who are visually appealing, then I think these kids can actually identify and want to be those people because for, I mean, it's not, it's simple. If kids can see it, then they think they can be it. So if they see and can identify with these women who are beautiful, who are glamorous and also have these not always considered glamorous jobs, then they can say, oh, well, I can do that. You know, this I don't have to be a person in a lab coat with some dopey glasses and dress all frumpy. I can be cool, have some style and be a scientist and not lose myself. Because that was actually something I struggled with, too, thinking, you know, naively just in high school that, oh, I'd have to stop being myself or I'd have to stop you know I have to pretty much (laughs) I I don't know I always say this and I laugh and nobody else ever laughs I really thought I was gonna have to turn into a white boy to be Mm. computer science when I was in high school and I told myself I can't have I was preparing myself like you're not gonna have any friends you're gonna dress in Dragon Ball Z shirts and have suspenders (laughs) and your hair is gonna be a mess like I was mentally preparing myself like because I really loved computer science but I was like okay you're going to be an outcast. You're going to be, but that was not the wow. case at all. But you know, just remembering what I was like at that age, if I had seen someone who was fabulous and was doing what I wanted to do, I would have been like, okay, let's do it. I probably would have started, you know, a whole lot earlier. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> wow. So, so you realize you didn't have to go through the urkelfication of your exactly. <laughs> in order for you <laughs> to be a scientist. And, and I, I think that's awesome, you know, because I have, I have daughters and I, I just, you know, mm-hmm. I, I appreciate what you did because uh, if you're around young black women, you see just the heterogeneity on their personalities, mm-hmm. the diverse sets of interests that they have. And uh, yeah. in, in fact, uh, in fact, one of my girls is actually studying engineering and, uh, awesome. you know, and it's just kind of unfortunate that we live in this world where uh, she she's going to have an easier time conversing and interacting with people if she's talking about love and hip hop or yeah. you know some of these other silly things that kids are being influenced by than if she's talking about you know computer engineering or all these mm-hmm. other things. So <clears throat> now let me ask you this: uh, Where did you grow up um, and all that stuff? So I grew up in Washington D.C. Um, grew up there the first 14 or so years of my life, and then when it was time for high school, I moved right over the border to um, Prince George's County and went to Oxon Hill. So most of my life was in the D.C. area, D.C. metro area, the D.M.V. as they've started calling it. Mm, okay. Yeah, I was just in. I was in D.C. two days ago. I went to the First Baptist Church in Glen Arden. Are you? Are oh, you cool. Yeah, yeah. It's a big old church, man. Yeah, that's a big church. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard you were there for your birthday. Yeah. Happy belated. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's it's my twenty eighth birthday. I I, awesome. I started counting backwards when I hit thirty five. <laughs> I don't know if people know you can do that. You um, know, that's you can do that. You can do whatever you want. There you go. There you go. Age is a number. Uh, so okay. So so uh, last question I, I wanted to ask. Actually, the second to last question is, how long did it take you to put together this list? And what was that process like for you? Okay. So for me, I'm very process oriented. And like, once I decided I'm going to make a list, my head automatically just went into steps and said, all right, I'm going to create an online form. I'm going to have people submit this. They're going to do that. They're going to do that. So it took me, I asked for everything to be in by May 1st and I put it out around June. But the thing is, I was traveling for a good solid month. 
you know, in the middle of all that happening. So if I had put like just concerted effort in doing it, it probably would have taken about three or four weeks. Mm. But um, it took about two months because it, the funny thing is, I did not get the motivation to start working on it until someone told me that I shouldn't do it. Mm, really? No. Yeah, I was literally at a conference. I don't care if I get in trouble for saying this, but there was a speaker and she studies um, black women in STEM. So science, technology, engineering and math, black women in STEM in the academy and academia. And I told her what I was thinking of. And she told me I was doing the wrong thing. And I was, you know, that wasn't the way to go about, you know, getting black women to do this. And I was like, you know what? I I'm going to do it. So mm. the best way to get me to do something to tell me not to do it. So, That's right. That's <laughs> like right. immediately at that conference right there, I started working on it, like at the table. I was like, let me go ahead and write some code because she playing games. She don't know. This going to be the best article on earth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that. I love that. And, and, and I mean, did you did you find that, you know, because academia, it's funny, you know, <laughs> It, sometimes academia can be restrictive on your intellectual mm-hmm. freedom, especially when you haven't made tenure yet and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, what you know? Do you, do you feel that there were people in academia who kind of said, "Okay, this is unconventional. Like, you know, why is she doing this? She shouldn't be doing this type of stuff." I mean, was was that kind of a common thing, or or was that just sort of one in a million? You know, people in academia, I did get some people at the conference who said, you know, you shouldn't do this. But then I got other people on the other side of the aisle saying, go ahead, girlfriend, please do. I wish I had something like this when I was younger. So um, but I feel like the older generation was a little bit more, you know, hey, critical, don't do that. But the younger generation professors were like, please do it. I'll be in it, whatever you want. So um, there was some pushback there. But in terms of tenure, I really don't. I have a weird view of tenure. I'm going to do my best at my job while continuing to be me. So if that gets me tenure, it does. If it doesn't get me tenure, then I'm still an awesome person. I can go do something else. Well, so I, I, I think that's the, the, the perfect view. And I, since we have other young scholars that are going to be watching this, I, I want to give you advice on camera so people can kind of hear this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the first thing I'll say is that uh, you're always going to be better at being you than you're going to be at being every, everybody else or mm-hmm. anybody else, right? Because, the, you know, I realized for myself when I was working on becoming a white boy to fit into finance, <laughs> I realized that I'm never going to be very good at being a white boy. It, at the very least, I'll never be as good at being a white man as white men already are. Right. right. At best, I'll be just sort of this, this you know, inferior replacement. And I didn't become alive as a scholar until I became myself. Now, mm. that does not mean, though, that there is not volatility that comes with that. You know, yeah. in, in general, in life, human nature, every psychologist will tell you that when people are different, when they stand out, you know, some people are not comfortable with that. And there's the mm-hmm. fear of the unknown, right? We, I need That's to shrink true. you back into my box because I, I'm comfortable living in this box, and I feel that this is the place everyone needs to be. And But the, the, the truth is that if you look throughout history, you know, the greatest scholars in history are those who push the envelope, who said, let's, right. let's do things a little better, a little bit different. But why do most people not do that? Well, because it is a little bit risky, right? Yeah. Um, and then I think, you know, when you talk about tenure, um, my, my view of tenure was that the reason people chase tenure most of the time, I, I argue, is, you know, the financial security, I think, is a very mm-hmm. important part of that, right? So you got this guaranteed paycheck forever and all this other stuff. And I said, so, okay, so that means that if I find a way to just make a bunch of money, then I'll pretty much have tenure. I can give myself tenure, right? Right. <laughs> and so um, so I just went out and I created a multi-million dollar business. And I said, okay, this is as good as having tenure. Yep, it uh, sure is. Right. You got so, security. <laughs> and, and, and I had a chance to really live. But So so it's not for the faint of heart, right? Not everybody should not try to do things that are going to be different and push the envelope. Some people mm-hmm. are just not built for that. It's like yeah. if you have a, a country, not everyone is made to go into the military. Some people need to stay back in the village and, and mm-hmm. be safe, right? But then you have those soldiers, you know, those those intellectual soldiers like yourself, I put you in that category, I'm, I'm going to claim it for yes. you, who, right, who, who will go out here and, and do some things that, that, you know, take some calculated, intelligent risk uh, for the betterment of not just your life and those around you, but for those behind you, mm-hmm. and because I guarantee you there's going to be a, a bunch of young, young ladies and young men who are going to see what you've done, and that's going to be their blueprint for success yep. when they get into academia. So I'm here to just say, way to go. Congratulations. You go, girl. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Like that, it feels good to hear that from someone like you because I constantly think about, okay, well, how will this be perceived on my, you know, 10 year portfolio review? But I feel like if I'm in a place that does not welcome this kind of conversation and this kind of discourse, I'm not putting anyone down. I'm not saying, you know, anything is better. Anybody's better than anyone else. If they don't encourage that, then I don't need to be there. So it's, one of the things where I'm at the point where I really just don't like my level of don't care is so high. <laughs> <laughs> it's dangerously high. It may be to a fault. Who knows? Maybe we'll pick this up again in six years and see what happens. But um, for me, and this was just something I learned in life, like you really cannot place your happiness, what you want to do, your goals based on what other people might think or what you fear other people might say. Like for me, making this article, that was being true to myself. Because it was something where I was like, I have to do this. Like, I just have to. So, you know, like you said, it's not for everyone. Not everyone has that motivation, that drive. Not everybody can stand up to the criticism. But for me, that's something that is in me that I would just be so sad if I didn't do. Well, I'm, I want to say congratulations. Um, congratulations on being you. And, <laughs> Thank and, you. Um, and I think that you are on your way to a great career, whatever that career is going to be. And, um, and I'm going to check out the list. I want everybody to know that you can go see this list of the sexiest black female scientists at KylaMcMullen.com. Let me spell that. It's K K Y L A M C M U L L E N dot com. Kyla McMullen. That's right. Yes. And so uh, this is Dr. Kyla McMullen, and I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins. And thank you so much, Dr. McMullen. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. All right. And those who are watching, um, please take care. God bless. Be strong. And we shall speak again soon. Peace.